In the last lesson, I tried to explain Newman projections and how we think about torsional strain and some issues of steric strain associated with different conformations. So here's an example of a typical Newman projection right here. This represents the staggered conformation, and this Newman projection represents the eclipsed conformation. An eclipsed conformation would ideally be eclipsed, but we want to offset that back or front carbon a little bit just so we can see what's going on in an eclipsed conformation. So even though this isn't perfectly eclipsed, generally speaking, this is what we assume eclipsed to look like when we're trying to draw a Newman projection. This is the more common, the lower energy state, the staggered conformation, and the difference between the two is primarily a function of torsional strain. The torsional strain occurs whenever you have a non-staggered conformation. And so as this thing goes from staggered over here to eclipsed, the torsional strain continues to get higher and higher and higher until when it is perfectly eclipsed, the torsional strain is at a maximum. You can also have things like steric strain, and steric strain occurs between the substituents coming off the front carbon in a, Newman, in a Newman projection and the substituents coming off the back carbon in a Newman projection. So these two methyl groups right here have some steric strain. And then we'll put an ethyl group down here on the bottom. This methyl group in front and this methyl ethyl group in the back have a dihedral angle of 180 degrees and their steric strain is minimized. This is referred to as an anti-orientation or the staggered conformation. In this staggered conformation, the methyl in the front and the ethyl in the back are anti. That's kind of the most correct way of saying that. If instead you compare the orientation of this methyl group in front and this methyl group in back, then you would say that these are gauche. Gauche is G-A-U-C-H-E, and the anti-orientation is A-N-T-I. The relationship that exists between this ethyl and this methyl is neither anti nor gauche because these are both part of the same, they're both attached to the same carbon. So that anti and the gauche refers to the relationship between substituents on the front carbon and the substituents on the back carbon, which is represented by this large circle. The dihedral angle is the angle between two substituents, specifically in a Newman projection. So this has a dihedral angle of 60 degrees and the dihedral angle between this methyl group and this ethyl group would be 180 degrees. There would not be a dihedral angle between this methyl group and this ethyl group because they're both coming off the same carbon. Dihedral angles refer to the angle in a Newman projection between things coming off the front carbon and things coming off the back carbon. All of this was an introduction and we're going to start we're going to take these concepts and now start looking them looking at them in cyclic alkane systems. So this is an example of cyclopropane. Over here on the right, you can see the standard ChemDraw panel, the two-dimensional ChemDraw panel. And then over here on the right is my attempt, is ChemDraw's attempt to model that in three dimensions. Um, hopefully you can see the cyclopropane. There's the three carbons right here inside of the cyclopropane. That corresponds to these three carbons over here in the two-dimensional model. You'll notice that this particular cyclopropane is decorated with two additional methyl groups. And so the methyl groups in the two-dimensional model are showing up he out here on the outside. And in the three-dimensional model, this is one of my methyl groups, and this is my other methyl group right here. These methyl groups are cis relative to the plane of the ring system. So if you imagine a plane that cuts directly through the ring system, which is kind of right here poking into and out of your screen, or over here in the two-dimensional model, right now this cyclohexane is flat, and both of these methyl groups are going away from you. So they are on the same side of the cyclopropane, and that therefore we call this a cis stereoisomer. And that introduces some new words and some new ideas that I'll get to in a second. But the first thing I want to do is think about the Newman projections that exist between the various carbons in this cis 1,2 dimethyl cyclopropane. First, let's look at the Newman projection that exists between the methyl group and the carbon in the cyclopropane. So the methyl group is highlighted here in yellow and the carbon of the cyclopropane is in the back. 
and you'll notice that this is approximately staggered. Now cyclopropane has a problem with bond angles and if you remember from geometry the internal bond angle of an equilateral triangle is 60 degrees so cyclopropane can't really give us the typical dihedral angles that we see of 60 degrees, 120 degrees, etc. But this methyl group right here is staggered as much as it can. And you'll notice on this side over here that does look like a 60 degree dihedral angle and then the rest of them are kind of messed up. Cyclopropane definitely has some problems and we're going to talk about all the problems of cyclopropane. The two methyl groups right here are free to undergo rotation and therefore will stagger as much as possible. That one looks a little off staggered. We'll see if we can get a little better energy situation out of that. Yeah, there we are. So we do what's called an energy minimization and that gives it a little bit more staggered. But what I really wanna focus on are the carbons inside of the cyclopropane. And so for the sake of simplicity, let's go ahead and just cut off these two additional methyl groups and just look at cyclopropane itself. And what you'll notice about cyclopropane is there are two types of strain that we need to talk about. First is torsional strain. And so if you cycle this around and look at every possible Newman projection, you'll notice that this compound is essentially staggered. So on this Newman projection, there it's perfect, sorry, eclipsed. It's perfectly eclipsed. And that is worst case scenario. This is maximized torsional strain. And a plane is defined by three points. So you really can't do anything to keep this thing from being totally flat because it only has three carbons. And because of its planar arrangement, what you end up with is this perfectly eclipsed system. And that produces a tremendous amount of torsional strain and makes cyclopropane a very unstable compound. The other type of strain, and this is a new type of strain to us, is called angle strain. And we actually can give angle strain a numerical value. And the way you do that is you think about the fact that this is an sp3 hybridized carbon. An sp3 hybridized carbon typically has a bond angle of 109.5 degrees. An equilateral triangle would have angles of 60 degrees and so the angle strain is the difference between the ideal bond angle of 109.5 degrees and the actual bond angle of 60 degrees. So this has 49.5 degrees of bond angle strain on every one of these carbon-carbon bonds inside the ring system. And that's a lot. That's a lot. That's the most bond angle strain that you typically see. The lesson is asking us to show a Newman projection for the cis conformation. So I'm going to go back and put those two methyl groups back on here. And we'll see what... Okay, I'm going to energy minimize that, just kind of let these methyl groups find the best possible orientation. And the carbon, the naming of this system, if we think about nomenclature in the two-dimensional model over here, this is going to be carbon 1 and carbon 2. So the name of this is cis, dash 1 comma 2 dash dimethyl cyclopropane and that's written out right here so for 1 2 dimethyl pro cyclopropane you can either have the two methyl groups be cis or trans and I'll talk about what this term stereoisomer means here in a second what we want to do now is draw the Newman projection so let's go back to the model the Newman projection sorry I need to figure out it needs to be down the C1 C2 bond so Newman projections are carbon specific this is the labeling system of ChemDraw3D, really doesn't care about correct numbers, but based on the way we would name this compound, this over here, let me highlight this in yellow, this is carbon one and this is carbon two. So if I highlight carbon one right here and I wanna put carbon two in the back, then this is the Newman projection that I need to show right here. And this is a mess. Eclipsed Newman projections are always difficult to show. Coming off the front carbon, I have a methyl group, I have this methylene carbon, and I have a hydrogen. So I'm gonna to go to my Newman projection. I'm gonna use the eclipsed one. Let's trim this down just a bit of the pieces I don't need. Because cyclopropanes are always eclipsed, then I'm gonna use this pre-drawn eclipsed Newman projection model. And there was a methyl group in the front, there was a hydrogen off to one side, 
and then there was this CH2 group right here that was actually a joint between those two. Uh, whoops, that should show CH2. Okay. That's interesting. It, we'll try this one more time. That's not helpful at all. <laughs> um, huh. Here, we'll just cheat a little bit. There. There's our CH2 label. And what you'll notice is that the front carbon is attached to the CH2 group, and that, that is the same CH2 that the back carbon is attached to. The back carbon also has a hydrogen right there, and it has a methyl group off of this position right there. Okay. And so that's ugly, and it's eclipsed, and that's exactly what you have to show for a cyclopropane. There's kind of no way around that one. So I'm going to take this diagram right here, and I'll drop it on... We want to show a Newman projection down C1, C2 for the cis stereoisomer. Okay, so there is a tremendous amount of torsional strain going on with this compound. You've got angle strain, that's a problem. And you're also going to see a lot of steric strain. These two methyl groups that are cis relative to each other, meaning that they're pinned to the same side of the plane of the cyclic ring are going to bump into each other. And that's what we call steric interactions. This is much worse than gauche. And this is eclipsed. Um, this is methyl groups are eclipsed directly on top of each other. You don't really have any type of steric issues over here because this is not bumping into anything. But these two methyl groups right here have a maximum amount of steric strain. And these two hydrogens have their own problems. Their electron clouds will bump into each other as well. Let's go back now and think about what the trans stereoisomer would look like. But I'd like to call your attention to one thing. In the energy minimization model, it actually calculates the potential energy of the compound as 10.3572 kilocals per mole. I'm just kind of hang on to that number, and we're going to compare it to the number we get when we look at the trans conformation. OK, so now what I have is trans. Okay. If I flatten this thing so that the cyclopropane is in a plane, you'll notice that one of the methyl groups is above that plane and one of them is below the plane. And that's what trans refers to, on opposite sides. If we do an, en enemy, sorry, an energy minimization parameter, uh, let's see, there it is, it comes up with 8.9165 kcals per mole. This is a lower energy compound. And so they are isomers of each other. They both have the exact same atoms. They're no longer called constitutional isomers of each other. This introduces us to a new type of isomer. Constitutional isomers are where you take an, uh, a bond and you break it and you reattach that somewhere else on the compound. Here, all we did was break this methyl group off of the yellow carbon right here and break the hydrogen off and just switch their places. And so when things have the same molecular formula and they differ in three dimensions, they're referred to as stereoisomers of each other. And so we're going to look at conformation versus stereoisomer. The conformational isomers, conformational isomers are rotations. Um, or they're just different uh, views of the same compound. Stereoisomers, and this is one word, stereoisomers, are three-dimensionally different, but have the same pattern of connection. So they're not constitutional isomers of each other. So this introduces uh, new types of, con of isomers, constitutional isomers. Not even close. <laughs> Constitu... There we go. All right, so now you have constitutional isomers where you fundamentally rearrange the sigma bonds and connect them to different atoms. You have conformational isomers, which are just different rotations or different ways of looking at something, and stereoisomers, which are three-dimensionally different. Um, and so you, and stereoisomers are not interconvertible. You can't go from cis back to trans again just by twisting a bond. You actually have to break something and reattach it somewhere else. Now we want to think about the strain associated with this. So the strain occurs because there's still a tremendous amount of angle strain right here. That's the new type of strain. 
there is still torsional strain. So if I go around the Newman projections, looking down each one of the carbon-carbon bonds in the side of the ring system, then you'll see that torsional strain is still maximized because everything is fully eclipsed. So angle strain is at its highest, torsional strain is at its highest, but steric strain is actually quite a bit lower. There's still gonna be some steric problems between this eclipsed hydrogen on the back of the carbon and this eclipsed methyl group but we no longer have the methyl group sitting directly on top of each other. And we can see that with our, our Newman projection. So let's leave that methyl group on the front carbon, but on the back uh, carbon, I'm gonna put a hydrogen there. And on the front carbon, there's still a hydrogen, but on the back carbon, now there's a methyl group right here. So this is slightly better. Uh, in fact, when we look at the ener energy minimization numbers, we see it's about two kcals per mole better, which may or may not be meaningful, but at least it puts a number on some stuff. Okay. So now we ask, of these two right here, which stereoisomer is more stable? And, uh, and the answer, they're both a mess, but of the two, the trans stereoisomer, stereoisomer is more stable because it has has less steric strain. They both still have all this angle strain that's a problem, and they also have these uh, torsional strain issues, and so we're gonna deal with that here in the next table, but between the two of them, we feel a little bit better about this trans stereoisomer than we do about the cis stereoisomer. Trans is generally uh, italicized and shouldn't be capitalized, but, um, but it, it's not a big deal. You guys. Uh, can handwrite most of this stuff, and I don't expect you to have that skill set of italicizing your handwriting. So we've looked at cyclopropane, and here is a heat of combustion table for cyclopropane, cyclobutane, pentane, hexane, heptane, etc. So three, four, five, six, and seven carbons. When you look at the heat of combustion data, and that is an indication of stability, only when you're comparing isomers of each other, and these compounds are not isomers. They do not have the same number of carbons. And the reason that the heat of combustion is going up as you go down this table is because you have more carbons in the compound. Throwing a, a small log on the fire will generate less heat. Throwing a very large log on the fire will generate more heat. So it's not fair to talk about stability when you're looking at the heat of combustion data unless you account for differences in the number of carbons, and that's what we're doing right here. So this is more or less heat of combustion per pound. So consider an example where you're, born, where you're burning a pine log versus an oak log, and you're trying to figure out which log gives off more heat. Well, whichever log is gonna be much bigger will give off more heat, and so the fair comparison is to do a heat per pound analysis. And that's what we're doing right here. We're dividing out by the CH2 groups, and what you'll notice is the cyclopropane, when you take into account the per CH2 factor, we find that on a carbon per carbon basis, this is a much less stable compound. It gives off a lot of energy when you burn it because it starts off at such an unstable high energy position. And that's because the angle strain is maximized. And so this is the highest angle strain we'll see, and we'll call that 49.5. The 49.5 was calculated by taking the ideal bond angle for an sp3 hybridized carbon of 109.5 and subtracting the actual bond angle of an equilateral triangle 60 and 109.5 minus 60 gives us angle strain of 49.5. All we really care about is saying that the angle strain is maximized, but I want to keep that number there as a point of reference for when we deal with these in a second. Torsional strain is also maxed. Okay. And that's because everything is fully eclipsed. And steric strain is not a problem for just regular cyclopropane. The examples that we looked at were cyclopropanes that had methyl groups on them. But this new table that we're thinking about now takes those methyl groups off. And what you'll notice is while there is torsional strain, that means that this thing is eclipsed when I sight down the barrel right there, and there's angle strain, meaning that these bonds are 60 when they should be 109.5. The hydrogens really aren't bumping into each other right here, so we don't have that steric issue. You might have noticed the numerical value output right here. 
4.8522 kcals per mole. That's a lot lower than we looked at before, but that's because I took those methyl groups off. So I'm not comparing um, things that are fair now. And this is a potential energy calculation and not a heat of combustion calculation. So it's just kind of used as a comparative value. So in any event, what we should see with cyclopropane is we have this horrible bond angle strain, and we've also maximized our torsional strain because it's fully eclipsed. So then what happens if we start looking at cyclobutane? So I'm going to clip this thing open here, and we'll look at cyclobutane. Now, cyclobutane is not a fully planar compound. Notice here that the side-on-side -side view of this thing is kind of tweaked, and that's on purpose. That's to minimize the torsional strain interaction. Uh, and so for this compound right here, if we cite down all of this of the carbon-carbon bonds to look at the Newman projections, you'll see that they're not fully eclipsed, but they're not even close to staggered. This dihedral angle here would ideally be 60 degrees. That's what a perfectly staggered dihedral angle looks like, and that's in the ballpark of 10 or 15 or so. And so we still have some torsional strain. In fact, quite a bit of torsional strain. And the angle strain here, a perfect square, has 90 degree bond angles. Angle strain is the difference between the value that you expect for an sp3 hybridized carbon like this one. You expect it to have a bond angle of 109.5. What you actually have is a bond angle that's closer to 90. 109.5 minus 90 would give you 19.5 degrees of bond angle strain. And that's quite a bit lower than what we saw with cyclopropane. So the angle strain is high, and this is 19.5. The torsional strain is also high, and you would say that this is almost eclipsed. Okay? The steric strain here is still minimal. Okay? I'm just going to put this minimal here and minimal right here. There's just not a lot of steric strain going on because if you look at the compound, None of these hydrogens are really bumping into each other. Right? This hydrogen is not bumping into that hydrogen. What you will notice, though, is that this hydrogen and that hydrogen right there are closer to each other than the hydrogens on the bottom side. And so there's not quite enough proximity. These aren't close enough to produce that type of, um, of steric strain, but we're going to see that becomes a bigger problem as these rings get progressively larger. I just kind of a tangent of chemistry. Um, you notice how this is this is actually a pucker. They call this the butterfly arrangement, and I guess this would be the head and the tail of the butterfly, and here are the two wings. You can see how it kind of puckers up a little bit. Um, nobody spends a lot of time thinking about cyclobutane, but it also shows us that molecules will do uh, literally twists in order to get away from being in a perfect plane. And what they're doing is they're getting rid of some of that torsional strain but the bond angles of this are actually a little less than 90 um, because they've expanded into three dimensions right here. So what you're doing is you're reducing your torsional strain and you're increasing your angle strain a little bit. And in the past, I've had students ask which of these types of strain is the most important. And the answer is they're all, they all kind of add together to produce the strain of the molecule. And so um, these different compounds will try to push strain into these different categories so that they reach a lowest overall value overall. But you really can't say that torsional strain is always better than angle or angle is always better than steric. It, it just depends on the molecule. Let's move on now to cyclopentane. So what we're going to do now is get rid of the cyclobutane. And we'll do, and so here we have cyclopentane, and we'll run an energy minimization just to kind of see what it looks like when it when it finds its sweet spot. And now we start citing down the carbon-carbon bonds. I'm not worried too much about the thinking about this number compared to previous numbers because they're not constitutional isomers of each other, so the energy considerations are really not that helpful. But what you'll notice is that the bonds right here are still not staggered. And in fact, they look to be fairly similarly nearly eclipsed as what I saw with cyclobutane. Right there, still not quite staggered. And then maybe a little bit more staggered. And then really nicely staggered right there. And nicely, a little bit, um, a little bit staggered right there. So it's not consistent at all. And they call this the envelope. This is the envelope or the half chair conformation that cyclopentane can adopt. 
And these are interesting structures, especially to biochemists. Um, the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA contains a sugar, and the sugar is a five-membered ring, and the actual conformation or the shape that that five-membered ring adopts creates some significant differences between DNA and RNA. And you may or may not learn about that when you take biochemistry. But there are lots of biochemists that spend a lot of time staring at this particular three-dimensional model. Probably Watson and Crick, when they're coming up with DNA structures, had to model this correctly, as correctly as possible. But for our purposes, we really don't care that much about cyclopentane in this chapter or in this course. The one that we care about the most is going to end up being cyclohexane, which is the next compound. But before we walk away, let's just kind of think about the different types of strain. So we have still some torsional strain. This one looks good, but the other ones still have kind of that eclipsed type conformation. And so going back to our chart, uh, under torsional strain, well, that's supposed to say high. Under torsional strain, we still have some. Okay? And so there's both a mixture of eclipsed and staggered. Um, angle strain isn't quite as bad. Um, the bond angle, I believe, for a pentagon, I should stop the video and look this up, but I'm just going to guess it's about 108 degrees, but it doesn't really matter exactly what it is because you'll notice that this thing is puckered in three dimensions, so it, it kind of bends a little bit, but the bond angles are actually pretty close to this 109.5 degrees. And so what we find for cyclopentane is that the angle strain is low, and so it's just a few degrees, a one to two degrees of angle strain that you see associated with those different bonds. Uh, a five-membered ring allows this thing to have approximately 109.5 degree bond angles. Finally, looking at steric strain, now we're starting to get a little crowded. Currently, I don't see any hydrogens that are in danger of kind of bumping into each other, but they're getting closer. So these two hydrogens right here might occupy a little extra space we can actually look at the space filling model and um, decide if that provides. Yeah, we're really not getting any side-on-side uh, -side adjacent touching of the electron clouds associated with the hydrogens here, but it's pretty close. Like there, that's getting pretty close. And that's the same atom, so we don't look at that. But here, no, that's probably the only one that we saw. Where was that? Yeah, right about here. So we, we're starting to see it. We're seeing a little bit of steric interactions here. So going back to our table right here, the steric interactions are still minimized, but they're not quite zero. So we're gonna call this greater than zero. And for the other ones, I'm gonna call the minimized and we're gonna call this uh, about equal to zero. And then here we'll call this minimized and then this is really, really close to zero. So we'll say about 0, 0.0. Okay. If sig figs are meaningful at all to you, that's what I'm trying to show right there. Okay, now for the one that we care about, cyclohexane. And why we care about this one should be apparent from this data point right there. You'll notice that per CH2 group, cyclohexane is where things are the best. And so even though the heat of combustion for cyclohexane is greater than cyclopentane because it's a bigger compound, when you take into account the number of carbon atoms, you'll see that cyclohexane is kind of the sweet spot. It's this low energy, compound and a very stable compound. And there's reasons why um, cyclohexanes show up in biology all the time, and that's because of the low energy state. Uh, cholesterol is a compound that has a lot of six-membered rings, as well as all of the cholesterol steroid type hormones like estradiol and testosterone and progesterone. So without further ado, here's cyclohexane the molecule that we care about the most. It is the second most testable molecule in uh, organic chemistry with benzene being one that's gonna show up later on and will show up on almost every exam repeatedly. This is benzene right here with alternating double bonds. It's an alkene structure that has some unique characteristics. Cyclohexane is kind of the alkane um, cousin of benzene. And this particular conformation is referred to as the chair conformation. And to see the chair, perhaps this is the best perspective to see the chair, we don't want to look at the hydrogens. And let's just focus right now on the black carbons right there. And so these four carbons, this one right here, and two, and then we skip this one, and we look at that carbon right there, and that carbon. So these uh, 
two pair two carbons on opposite sides they can be put in a plane and they represent the seat of your chair this carbon here in the back that's poking up represents the head of the chair and then this carbon down here represents the foot of the chair so this is kind of like a lazy boy recliner and uh, it took me a while to figure that out and i was grateful when somebody finally told me that's the type of chair we're talking about is a lazy boy and so this again here are the four carbons one two three four that represent the seat of the chair and then you have the carbon poking up is the head of the chair and the carbon poking down is the foot of the chair and then what you'll notice is right now the foot of the chair right here is this yellow carbon the foot of any chair can be the head of a different chair just depending on your perspective i'll just flip this thing over right here um, and so now there's the four carbons that represent the, the seat of the chair. I've got them now eclipsed on top of each other. This yellow car carbon is poking up. That's the backrest of the chair. And here's the footrest of the chair right here. Um, I looked at one of these model kits one time with a group where I was driving the model kit and a bunch of students got motion sick. So if that's the case, I'm sorry, sort of. So here, let's show you something else that any carbon can be the head or the foot of any chair. So let's look at this carbon right here. Right now, from my particular perspective, this yellow carbon is in the seat of the chair. But if I just choose a different perspective, that yellow carbon can be the foot of a chair. So now I've eclipsed those four carbons right there. They represent one, two, three, four. They represent the seat of my chair. And this yellow carbon now represents the foot of my chair. If I flip it over, now that yellow carbon represents the head of my chair. And so any carbon can be the foot or the hair or the seat, sorry, the foot or the head or the seat of the chair, just depending on your particular perspective. And hopefully what you realize is that this tells us there's a lot of symmetry in the compound. And energetically, all these carbons are equivalent. Okay, so what? Why is this such an important compound? Well, let's look at the Newman projections. So focusing on, let's put the yellow carbon in the front and that black carbon, the gray carbon in the back. And what you'll notice is that is perfectly staggered and perfectly staggered and perfectly staggered and perfectly staggered, perfectly staggered, etc. And this is the magic of a cyclohexane is that your strain, your torsional strain is at a minimum and it's equal to zero. Okay? Just solid zeros across the board. Now, the molecules will kind of wiggle a little bit just because of the random fluctuations of molecules at room temperature, but there is a possibility that exists. There is an energy state that is available where everything can be perfectly staggered. As far as bond angles go, the internal bond angle of a hexagon is 120 degrees, but because we've expanded into three dimensions, this is no longer really a hexagon. It's a, it's, it's a chair. And what they find is that the internal bond angles here are 109.5 degrees. That's exactly the bond angle that you expect for a tetrahedral. And so this right here, the, the angle strain is also at a minimum. It's equal to zero point. It's just like a perfect angle. I, um, the point of me putting multiple zeros is just to emphasize the point that this is best case scenario. Now, the last issue to look at is steric strain. And this is where we see a little problem associated with the cyclohexane conformation. This hydrogen right there, right, highlighted in yellow, is, if we, if we look at it right here, if I kind of tilt this a little bit and you just imagine that this hexagon is fairly flat, what you'll notice is that this hydrogen is poking up from the, kind of from the structure whereas the other hydrogen is poking out. Therefore, this hydrogen is what's called axial. Right? And this hydrogen on the outside is called equatorial. And if I rotate that and look at a different carbon, this is the hydrogen that's poking down. So the axial hydrogens are either straight up or straight down. So that's axial, 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 axial. The equatorial hydrogens kind of just kind of sit on the equator. They roll around the periphery and they're always pointing outward. And what you'll find with a cyclohexane chair conformation is everything is great except for these axial hydrogens. These hydrogens that are either straight up or straight down actually start to share electron cloud density um, 
they bump into each other with the other hydrogens that are straight up or straight down. Notice how this carbon, if we call this carbon carbon number one, then the hydrogen on carbon number one is bumping into the hydrogen on carbon number three and the hydrogen on carbon number five. So I guess this is one and this is three and this is five. They, are, they often call this a one, three, or a 1,5 or a 3,5 diaxial interaction, meaning that the hydrogens that are coming off in the axial orientation are starting to bump into each other. And that happens both above the plane of the six-membered ring and it happens below the plane. These three hydrogens down here are also bumping into each other sterically. Whereas these equatorial hydrogens, which we can see best if we turn the, and look straight down on this compound, these six equatorial hydrogens right here, they're not, they don't have that same steric problem. So the way we describe this is that there is axial um, problems. The equatorials are fine, but the axial hydrogens have specific problems associated with them. As the rings start to get larger and larger, then they just can't find that same sweet spot. We see that with the data with cycloheptane right here, that per CH2, this comes out looking better than cyclopentane. And so the angle strain here is still low, uh, probably the same ballpark. There's one to two degrees of angle strain across each bond. You have some in some of the stereotorsional strain, and then you're also starting to get a little bit more of the steric strain. And as the ring systems get larger and larger, then they start to run into these problems. And so this is kind of a local minimum. And then if we look at eight, nine, and 10 membered rings, this would continue to get moderately larger. And it does it very slowly. Uh, I was gonna see if I had that data down below, I don't. Uh, and the main reason is I just don't care. The point is that cyclohexane is the best that uh, cycloalkane is going to end up. And if you're too big or too small, then you start to end up with some problems. This is cycloheptane, just kind of looking around. The, there's a nice, not quite staggered, very close. Um, maybe that's almost perfectly staggered. A little bit eclipsed right there. Um, so it's not evenly distributed. There's some more eclipsed. There's a better looking staggered. And then your bond angles just don't hit that sweet spot again. And now we're starting to see more of this steric problem, especially between those two hydrogens right there. They're gonna start running into each other. Let's see if what we find with the space filling model right here. Oh yeah, yep, there we have the overlap between that yellow hydrogen and that yellow hydrogen. Starting to see some overlap of electron cloud right there. And that's steric interactions. And that actually looks worse than what we saw with, um, that's right there, there's the contact point. That was worse than what we saw with cyclopentane, but it's just a model. And so the model tells us that this is the best case scenario. This is kind of what we're shooting for right here is cyclohexane. All right, this next question um, addresses a common concern that I get from students. So I went in order to answer the question and I'll explain the question after I explain the data. This is from the National Bureau of Standards. This is back in May of 1946. And this is clearly old fashioned. That's why they have the N propyl cyclopentane right there, and somebody didn't bother to put a hyphen there. Um, when at that point you had to type everything out, and so I imagine when they saw that they didn't care. They also left out the L, so no one cares at this point right there. So um, what I want to look at is, so they have the heat of combustion data right here, and your textbook should have a very similar looking table, and the values are close, not exactly the same, but we've had um, 80 years now to update this data. And then they happen to choose kind of an odd temperature of 28 degrees Celsius to run the experiment at. That must have just been the temperature of the laboratory they were running in, and that might predate the uh, air conditioning. So I, I pulled that data over here. Here's the compound names from that same chart. And then we have all of the heat of combustion data. Remember when you burn something, it's always gonna give off heat. So that's typically shown in general chemistry as a negative value. In organic chemistry, we don't like to deal with the negatives. So we kind of offset everything just by dropping the negative symbol and then identifying that we're showing the opposite of the heat of combustion value. Um, cyclopentane has five carbons methyl cyclopentane would have the five carbons of cyclopentane plus one more carbon for the methyl group. Ethyl cyclopentane has seven carbons, 
Propyl cyclopentane has eight, cyclohexane with six, methyl cyclohexane with seven, ethyl cyclohexane with eight, propyl cyclohexane, that's three for the propyl, six for the cyclohexane, and then butyl cyclohexane. All right, when you're comparing heat of combustion data, the most important factor is the number of carbons. And so in this chart right here, if we were to order this, uh, we can sort our data by the number of carbons. What you'll notice is by when we sort it by the number of carbons, then the lowest heat of combustion value right here corresponds to the lowest number of carbons. Six carbons then have the next two lowest heat of combustion values, seven have the next lowest, and eight, and nine, and so forth. All right, um, now because we're dealing with different number of carbons, in order to have a fair comparison, we need to divide out by the number of carbons. So I'm gonna take this value right here, this heat of combustion, and just divide it by the number of carbons. And then I'll just kind of drag that down right there. Ah, it's a lot more digits than anyone needs. And that looks about right with sig figs. Okay, what's the point? Well, what I want to do now is start looking at what can we say about if heat of, about the stability of compounds in these different situations. So I'm going to highlight all of the cyclopentane values. So there's cyclopentane, there's a methyl cyclopentane, and an ethyl cyclopentane. Everything else is a cyclohexane. So what you'll notice is that uh, in every case, 653, 651, 655, 52, 52, yeah. For every one of these compounds, the cyclohexane ends up being more stable. It has a lower heat of combustion per carbon. And so let's, um, when we compare things that have the same number of carbons right here, the cyclopentane with the cyclohexane, notice how the cyclohexane has a lower heat of combustion per carbon and a lower heat of combustion overall. This means, and these two are constitutional isomers of each other. They both have this, the chemical formula of C6H12. So setting them on fire is a fair comparison. And what we find is that the cyclohexane is more stable than the cyclopentane. And that's why this sometimes causes some concerns for students. Let's think about what those structures look like. There's cyclohexane and there's methylcyclopentane. And this compound right here has a lower heat of combustion. So this is a lower heat of combustion and therefore it is more stable. And this comparison is fair because they have the same chemical formula. These are constitutional isomers of each other. And this one up top has a higher heat of combustion and therefore it is less stable. Now, this might, might be confusing to you if you remember when we looked at acyclic or linear alkanes, we found that the more branches you introduce, the more stable the compound tends to be. And in cyclic systems, that's not the trend that we're seeing. So if I were to give you two different isomers of butane, here's one, and here's another bu uh, isomer of butane. This one's called isobutane and butane. These are isomers of each other. You would expect for this compound on the bottom to be more stable because it's more substituted. And the compound on the top would be less stable because it's less substituted. And that statement is true unless you're dealing with cyclic systems. Once you get to cyclic systems, the amount of branching really isn't that important. And the reason for that is this table right here. Branching will introduce some steric strain and it may not help your angle torsional and torsional strain. So cyclic systems are more complicated and generally speaking, the more stable compound is the one that looks more like cyclohexane. That's going back to that data sheet that I generated. So that's why methyl cyclopentane and cyclohexane, they have the same number of carbons. The methyl, methyl cyclopentane is more branched, but the branching isn't helping here. It is a difference where the six-membered ring is better than the five-membered ring. And that's the main criteria we use when comparing 
uh, cyclic systems. Here is an apples to apples comparison. We have seven carbons in ethyl cyclopentane, seven carbons in methyl cyclohexane, and the methyl cyclohexane is more stable. And the reason it's more stable is because it has a six membered ring as the basis. So cyclohexane generally makes a much more stable system. And there's probably more that we could pull out of that data, but that's kind of the point I wanted to make is that this particular analysis where we look at heat of combustion per carbon, I'm just going to drag that table over here. And so it asks us, what do these data suggest about the stability of substituted al cycloalkanes? Substitution in cycloalkanes is less important than the factors associated with the ring system. And cyclohexane is generally more stable than any other ring, regardless of substitution. Whereas with regular linear alkanes, substitution was all you had to worry about. With cyclic alkanes, the substitution isn't as straightforward. It doesn't generally help. It's the six-membered ring that you're looking for, and everything else is kind of trivial. All right. The last part of this lesson is now going to ask you to think about what happens when you start putting stuff on cyclohexane? And so, for example, although I didn't want to talk about it, and now I do, when you look at ethyl cyclohexane versus propyl cyclohexane, what you'll notice is their heat of combustion values are higher for the propyl cyclohexane because it has more carbons, but per carbon it ends up being very similar. In fact, yeah, this one's a little higher but this was data collected in 1946. Even data collected today, I wouldn't get that excited about that kind of margin of difference. And so it is difficult to differentiate between the stability of an ethyl cyclohexane and a propyl cyclohexane given this very small um, difference in their heat of combustion values. But we can start to look at things like dimethyl cyclohexanes, and that's what we're going to look at now. Uh, the first thing I need you to do is to be able to draw a reasonably coherent chair conformation with your hand on a piece of paper. And so I'm not going to do it with my hand on a piece of paper. I'm going to show you how to do it correctly using ChemDraw. And the way you draw a cyclohexane chair, and so this actually has a template for it. There's a chair conformation right there. And in order to draw that, what you'll actually need to think about is there are three different pairs of parallel lines. So this line right here is parallel with this line right there. And those are parallel to each other. This line is parallel with this line right here. And this line over here is parallel with this line right here. So this right here represents, uh, this shows you how in a cyclohexane chair there are three pairs of parallel lines. In order, to, in order to draw this correctly, you want to start drawing these in pairs. And I'm going to draw the seat of my chair first and assume that this is the head of the chair and the foot of the chair. And in order to draw the seat of the chair, you start off with one of those lines that's not quite horizontal. Okay, so don't use a horizontal line. Use something that's slightly off horizontal. And then you kind of shift over and up a little bit and draw a line that's parallel to it that's also not quite horizontal. Give these just a bit more space. Then from the lower point, you can make about a 90 degree angle coming straight up and then tilt it just a tad. And that starts my second pair of parallel lines. From the upper point coming down, I'm going to draw a 90 degree and then open it up just a tad. A little bit more maybe. Yeah, those look about parallel. That looks about parallel to this one. And if you've drawn everything correctly, then the last lines should fall into place parallel like that. Um, that's pretty close. There, I'm going to cheat just a tad. Okay, so this right here maps reasonably well onto that thing right there. And the idea is to keep track that you have three sets of parallel lines. So hopefully take a minute and practice drawing these ones. And then you also want to draw kind of the, uh, the mirror image reflection of it. 
And so this one would look like that. And if I try to draw a mirror image reflection of this, then instead of starting off with horizontal where it's tilted up, I'm going to start off with horizontal where it's tilted down. You come up and over a little bit, and the next one should be horizontal tilted down, 90 degrees, open it up just a tad, 90 degrees, open it up just a tad, and then you connect the dots right here. I don't think I connected those. Let me try that one last one again. I've never done this in ChemDraw before. I've always just used the ChemDraw drawing template or done it on the chalkboard back when the world was normal. Okay, so those are reasonable approximations of what they're supposed to look like. And the Now that you've drawn in kind of the carbons of the chair diagrams, and what you want to do now is come in and draw in the hydrogens. The hydrogens are either axial or equatorial. And if we start at the head of the chair, the hydrogen that is axial will go straight up. That's my hydrogen right there. And then you come over to the adjacent carbon and that hydrogen will go straight down. And then the adjacent carbon goes straight up, straight down, and it just kind of alternates up. And then this last one goes down. Um, I'm going to go ahead and send this to the back. Maybe it'll let me. Nope. Here, I'll just break this and redraw it on top of it. There we go. Okay, this shows the six axial hydrogens of a cyclohexane right there. Um, I'm going to label them with A, just to show that I mean to say that these are the axial hydrogens right here. The equatorial hydrogens, when you draw those, and I'm going to clear this off just to give myself some more space. Your equatorial hydrogens need to come more or less outward, but they need to be parallel to the, the part of the chair that they're not directly connected to. So that's not currently correct, but let me show you what I mean by that. This bond is connected to that carbon. That carbon is connected to this line of the chair and that line of the chair. It is not connected to that line of the chair. And so this right here needs to be parallel to the line of the chair that it's not connected to. So that's how you show the, ex the equatorial one right there. I'm going to call this EQ, if it'll let me. It's not going to like that label at all. All right, so this one right here, off of this position, it needs to be parallel to the line that it's not touching. It's touching this line, and it's touching this line. So you say, well, I'm going to make it parallel to that line. But you can't because that line and that line are supposed to be parallel. So you can't make this parallel to that line like that. It needs to be parallel to the line of the chair that is not touching, which is this line right there. So I'm going to drag that down just a little bit until it's parallel right there. And then we'll call this one equatorial as well. And this gets messy in a hurry. Uh, I'm going to make these labels a little smaller. Okay, now I can fit everything out around this better. Um, so off this carbon, it needs to be roughly parallel to that line. Those two lines should be parallel, and this should be equatorial. <laughs> that wasn't helpful. I'm going to go ahead and finish this up without you. Uh, you try the same. Pause the video, and then try to draw in the rest of these, and then we'll come back and look at it. All right, now ChemDraw has a snap to grid function, so I started all over again. Um, what you'll notice is that, and I labeled the A's as axial and the D's as equatorial, just for the sake of simplicity. And what I've marked here with the dashed line are the two kind of parallel lines that I used to start off my chair conformation. And I should see if the seat of the chair has two parallel lines, then the equatorial coming off the head and the foot of the chair should be parallel to those as well. Um, and just kind of strip this down piece by piece. So this equatorial and that equatorial need to be parallel to the lines that make up the seat of the chair. I'm going to take those off just to kind of strip down the clutter of this little bit by little bit. And so we'll take the axials off. And now let's focus on the this equatorial. Sorry, this part of the chair should be parallel to this part of the chair. And there should be two equatorial bonds that are also parallel right there. And so we'll kind of get rid of those. 
and we'll get rid of the axial ones off there as well. And then now we're, la we're left with the last two. These two right here should be parallel with the legs of the chair that they're not touching right there. So those should all four be parallel lines. Um, let's see if I got that right, yeah. Now you can kind of see the fact that those are parallel lines a little better. Okay, let's rebuild this thing. So when you're done, your cyclohexane with all four, sorry, all six of the axial and all six of the equatorial should just be a whole sequence of parallel lines that are coming off of this. All right, now that you've practiced somewhat drawing the cyclohexane chair conformations, let's think about the inherent flexibility of these carbon-carbon single bonds because they can rotate. And what they find is experimentally they will rotate in a way that's called ring flipping. Now, ring flipping is not like this. This is not what they mean by flipping a ring or just uh, kind of orienting it in space like this. What they mean is that the bonds inside of the ring will actually rotate and the head of the chair will become the foot of the chair and the foot of the chair will become the head of the chair. I have a couple different ways to try to show you this. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is let's just get rid of these hydrogen atoms and just focus on the six member, uh, the six carbons inside of the chair conformation. Let's make the yellow one the head of a chair. There we go. Remember that anything that is the head of a chair can be the foot of a chair if we just kind of move things around a little bit. Uh, it could also be the seat of the chair if you want it to be. There's Now it's the seat and this is the new head. So you can take any carbon you want and put it anywhere you want. All right, for now, this yellow carbon is the seat of the chair that I happen to be looking at. Uh, there's carbon, carbon, and then these four carbons, carbons labeled one, three, four, and six, in by ChemDraw, represent the seat of my chair, this carbon represents the head of my chair, and this carbon represents the foot of my chair. These bonds can rotate, and when they rotate, right, this carbon atom right here can actually swing up. Instead of a chair conformation, this particular rotation is often, this conformation is referred to as the boat conformation. And it has massive steric issues associated with it, and so it represents kind of a transition point. If that carbon rotates up, like I just showed you, it will force, for, in order to minimize sterics, it'll push that carbon down to the bottom right there. And so this is a ring flip that the carbon that used to be the foot of my chair actually rotated and came up to the top and the carbon that was the head of the chair rotated and went down to the bottom. You can kind of watch them rotate back there they just unrotated. So the ring flipped one way and then it flips back and at room temperature these rings are flipping back and forth and back and forth and back and forth all of the time. And what this means, let's kind of think about the consequences that this have. So this right here is a model I stole from the internet and what it's showing you is a cyclohexane chair. So there's one of the carbons in the seat of the chair. This carbon in the back corner there is the other seat, seat, seat. So there's the four carbons that you would sit on. And then this is the back rest of your chair. And that's the foot rest of your chair. The hydrogens coming off of here are colored either white or red. Hopefully you're able to recognize that the red hydrogens represent the six axial hydrogens and the white hydrogens represent the six equatorial hydrogens. Energetically speaking, those hydrogens are not the same. The hydrogens that are red in axial have more steric problems, and the hydrogens that are white have less steric problems. So from an energetic perspective, you would want to be in the equatorial position. In this animation, they show how the ring flipping occurs. And what you'll notice during ring flipping is the red hydrogens, which used to be axial, by the time the ring is done flipping, they end up equatorial. So this is how we can tell that a ring has flipped. It's because the axial bonds, the six axial bonds, in this case, all six hydrogens that are axial, move to the equatorial position. Hydrogens are energetically equivalent to each other, so this particular molecule does not care if it has the ring flipped in one orientation or the other. These represent two different conformational isomers.
And that's why in the ChemDraw document, they have the two different ways of showing a ring flipped. Uh, this is th these two different chair conformations represent ring flipping, where if I were to take this, this is going to get ugly. If I try to take this carbon and flip it up and this carbon and flip it down, uh, like I said, it gets ugly. Then this structure right here is supposed to be represented by that structure right there. Um, I'll undo that. So these right here represent the two different extreme conformations. And if this carbon right here has an axial hydrogen, after it undergoes ring flipping, and I grab that carbon and I pull it down to make the foot of my new chair, and I take this carbon and rotate it up to produce the head of my new chair, then that axial hydrogen is now an equatorial hydrogen. So these two compounds right here are just different conformations of the same molecule. And like I said, hydrogens don't really care if they're axial or equatorial because if I take this hydrogen and make it equatorial, yay for that hydrogen, but the other hydrogen out here that used to be equatorial is now going to end up in the axial position. So we'll call this hydrogen D, uh, deuterium, just so we can kind of tell them apart. Let's see, is that? Uh, that looks about right. And so this represents ring flipping right here. When I take that carbon and drag it down, this hydrogen goes from axial to equatorial, and this deuterium goes from equatorial to axial. And energetically, these would be approximately the same. It matters, though, as soon as you start putting something with some steric bulk on there, like a methyl group. So in this particular case, the methyl group is in the equatorial position. When bonds rotate, just like they do under normal room temperature conditions, occasionally this methyl group will find itself down here in the axial position. This axial methyl group is now going to start to sterically run into the hydrogen at the three position. And so this methyl group is now bumping into that hydrogen to produce a steric problem. There's going to be steric strain associated with it. And so it will push the molecule to flip, rotate that methyl group back out to the equatorial position. And we expect for this conformation to represent the behavior of the compound like 95% of the time. Right? It will flip and the methyl group ends up in the axial position, but then it just flips right back out again and ends up in the, in the equatorial position. All right, um, let's kind of finish up the lesson and add in the definitions. And I want to show you kind of one more model of why we care about ring flipping. So here's the chair conformation of cyclohexane. This question number four is really just to give you an opportunity to practice drawing pairs of parallel lines, where these two lines are parallel, this line and that line are parallel, and this line and that line are parallel. Then question five asks you to draw both chair conformations of methylcyclohexane and explain why one conformation is more stable than the other. Conformations just represent differences in time. So you can think about this as a staggered gauche. Sorry, this would be the staggered gauche because it's got more problems. And this would be the staggered ante. Um, we looked at butane and how butane will rotate between the staggered gauche and the staggered ante. But it prefers the staggered ante. And this conformational isomer is more stable. Just like in butane where the staggered ante is more stable, this conformation is the more stable of these two because the methyl group is in the equatorial position and the equatorial position has less steric strain. Let's check our definitions. Angle strain is any deviation or difference from the ideal angles predicted by hybridization. Because alkanes only have sp3 hybridized carbon, then the angle strain in today's lesson just dealt with deviations from the sp3 109.5 degree angles. Chair conformations of cyclohexane represent the most stable conformation. And um, ring flipping of cyclohexane is an interconversion. Conversion. 
between as an as a Mormon, you'd think I would know conversion. Uh, interconversion between um, different chair confirmations, where axial goes to equatorial and equatorial goes to axial. Axial doesn't need a capital letter there. Uh, if you want one, that's fine. Nobody cares. Okay. And then finally, axial and equatorial bonds on cyclohexane. The axial are the vertical. And it kind of depends on your perspective. So they're not always vertical, but that's generally how I think about them. Um, are the, and there are six of them. Are the six vertical bonds on the chair and are more sterically strained. Equatorial are the six outer bonds on the chair and are less sterically strained. So in our example of methyl cyclohexane, the methyl group forces this chair conformation to exist the majority of the time. I believe there's some data in your textbook that says it's about 95% of the time it's in this orientation and 5% of the time it's in this conformation. Uh, if you look at some of these other examples we saw, we actually looked at ethyl cyclohexane right here. Okay? And if you were to change out that methyl group for an ethyl group, the ethyl group would be even more problematic in the axial position. So instead of a 95 to 5 ratio, you'd start to get close to a 99 to 1 ratio where only 1% of the time it would put the ethyl group in the axial position. And the more carbons you have, a propyl, which is three carbons, or a butyl, which is four carbons, you would expect for the axial position to represent less and less and less of the percentage of the way that the molecule behaves. In ChemDraw right here, I can take this hydrogen off and replace it with a methyl group and force it to be in the axial position. I'm going to do that when you're not looking because it takes me a long time to figure it out. OK, those are minutes of my life. I won't get back again. I'm not even sure if I could do that again if I had to. So here I have a cyclohexane chair conformation with a methyl group right here coming off of it. So this is one methyl cyclohexane. And hopefully you can appreciate that the methyl group is coming off in the axial position. So um, just for the sake of simplicity, let's hide all the hydrogens. You should be able to see these four carbons make up the seat of the chair. This carbon right here represents the foot of the chair and that carbon represents the head of the chair. And coming off the head of the chair straight up is that axial methyl group right there. I'll put the hydrogens back on again. And when we look at the space filling model of this one, this is where we really start to see the problems that that methyl group has in the axial position. So there's the yellow methyl group right there. And these hydrogens here and here are the hydrogens that are coming off of carbon three and carbon five in the axial position. And they are bumping right into the electron cloud of that methyl group. And so if we go back to the ball and stick model, and I'm going to go ahead and see if allowing this to undergo an energy minimization will ring flip it. It will not. So I need to move that methyl group over. Okay, I'll pull the methyl group down there, and now I'll do an energy minimization. Okay, now hopefully you can appreciate that the methyl group is in the, ax in the equatorial position. So this is the head of this carbon that is highlighted in yellow is the head of the carbon. Sorry, the head of the chair. Nope, sorry, now it's the foot of the chair. And then this carbon over here is the head of the chair. And coming off the head of the chair outward in the equatorial position is that methyl group. And if we go to the space filling model for this one, the hydrogens coming off of that methyl group now that it's in the equatorial position 
where we said before that's where it's supposed to be. Notice how none of the electron clouds of those hydrogens are physically running into the hydrogen's electron clouds anywhere else. So the purpose of this space filling model was to try to emphasize the point that when something can ring flip, it will ring flip in such a way that it puts the larger and more sterically bulky groups like methyl groups or a tert beetle group would be a nightmare. It will shove it over into the equatorial position and away from the axial position by ring flipping. And ring flipping is just a simple conformational change just like eclipsed and staggered were different conformations of each other.